Uh, where next? This sign's right. I'm on the road to Damascus. Now, if you left that sign and kept on heading towards Damascus, you would have eventually, in Roman times, came to this Roman gate. Well, Acts 9 verses 10 and 11 put it nicely. The Lord saith to his disciple Ananas, Please go to Judas's house on Straight Street, and there you will find a man praying. I've sent him a vision that he will see again and he'll be converted. And this is Ananas' house, complete with obligatory chapel. And this is Straight Street. And it's pretty cool to actually be walking along places mentioned in the Bible. Damascus, though, is much more than a couple of Christian biblical stories. In fact, Damascus well predates Christendom. It claims to be the oldest continually inhabited capital in the world. And a lot of its history co-locates, and the best example of that is this building here. The Umayyad Mosque. The Umayyad Mosque started its life built by the Armenians about 1500 BC and it was a temple to the god Hadad. It was then taken over when the Romans turned up and turned into a temple to Jupiter. By the time the Byzantines arrived they decided it was going to be a cathedral commemorating St John the Baptist because like the Muslims, the Christians believe John the Baptist's head is in there in a little house with a sarcophagus covered by a green cloth. Indeed, Muslims believe that this is the place that Jesus will reappear before the end of the days. Never forget Jesus is venerated in Islam as well. In 1188 AD, Salahuddin walked up these stairs to preach in this mosque to call for a jihad against Richard the Lionheart. Then went up to Jerusalem and defeated him. And just to tick off the history tour, when Chinggis Khan invaded the place, he liked the mosaics along the western portico so much that he chipped off the ones on the northern portico. Whether it was an act of va vandalism or an act of theft, who knows? Ask the British, they're good at stealing porticos. And when you step outside the mosque, you just look up and you see Roman, Byzantine, and architecture just sitting next to each other, seemingly dotted around the city. I'm in Hama, Syria. I could say ancient city of Hama, but every city is ancient and you can almost get sick of saying it. This is the old mosque of Hama. And there's something interesting about the Roman history here too. So this noise you might hear might sound like a motor mower, but it's not. It's the wooden pin in the middle of this water wheel going around. Now this water wheel is a 17th century replica of a Roman water wheel that picked water up from down here, lifted it all the way up to the top along to this aqueduct, and that is what fed water to the fields and the irrigation back in Roman times. And when speaking of Romans and Roman history in Syria, when you get down to the south of Bosra, is this old Roman theatre, probably built during the reign of Emperor Trajan in the second century. Bosra had about 80,000 people and this theatre could hold about 17,000. During the 12th century, the Islamic defenders against the Crusaders built a citadel around the outside and thankfully the Crusaders never came. So a thousand years difference in architecture between 2nd century Roman, 12th century Islamic. Also, during the recent events, there's small amounts of damage from the conflict between the new Syrian army and the Syrian army. This is the area around which the whole revolution ticked off a decade or so ago. But this is one of the most well-preserved Roman theatres you'd ever go to, probably the most preserved in Syria, perhaps the Mediterranean, perhaps in the entire Roman Empire. So I'm in Melula, which is an area of Syria where they still speak Aramaic, which is the language of Christ. 
and this is the first uh, monastery named after Saint Sarkis. So Sarkis, if you're watching this, this one is for you. And this is one of two remaining altars from the Aramaic days where they had a lip on them and a hole in them because this is where they would lay down the sacrifices and kill them and the blood would go down here. And then when the order went out that no sacrifices in Christian churches anymore, every altar in Christendom has to be flat now. And this, I'm told, is one of only two left that still has the lip and the drain hole from the days when they gave sacrifices in the Aramaic days. So what language did Jesus Christ speak? He spoke Aramaic. And what does Aramaic sound like? Well, this is one of a few places left where Aramaic is still spoken. This is the Lord's Prayer in Aramaic. <laughs> In the canyons and mountainside outside Malula here, there's a whole lot of old cave carved graves for them from the Aramaic time. Again, showing just how much history there is in this country and every single turn. Here in Homs, in this being rebuilt mosque, is the tomb of Khalid, the sword of Islam, the man that brought Islam to Syria and was the defense minister, if you like, for the Prophet Muhammad. Fun fact, all of his soldiers rode on horses that were male, no female horses. Humanity can be really stupid to itself sometimes. Welcome to Crack de Chevalier, one of the best preserved crusader castles in the Middle East. Used a lot in conflict, most recently, now. So Crack de Chevalier was a castle built for the crusaders, said to have been used by Richard the Lionheart, but also used by ISIS terrorists who snuck across in some of the uh, tunnels from Lebanon. Some pretty impressive stuff here, like the Hall of the Knights, great vaulted ceilings. And one of the advantages of coming to countries like Syria at the moment, because there aren't many tourists around, is you get to see a place like this on your own. 2,000 men could be stationed here, largely men. And after you've eaten and had your fill, you need to go to the latrine. And in the old days, you wouldn't walk outside the walls because those drop straight outside. No flushing, no sewage, straight down. This is the Chapel of the Knights. The Knights Hospitalia, the Maltese Knights, were here during the Crusades. When the Muslims defeated them, they turned this chapel into a mosque. There were wonderful frescoes painted here, and when ISIS came in, they painted over the frescoes with gypsum, which is a real shame. Hungarians are trying to recover them. ISIS also stole the font that was here. Being knights, they had to have a round table. That's the round table. The design of Crack de Chevalier is quite good, actually. It's got an outer wall with a moat and then an inner wall and a whole lot of secret passages that aren't so secret. This little secret tunnel, not so secret, goes 14 kilometres to Wadi Khalid in Lebanon. And that was the main tunnel that ISIS used to bring fighters from Lebanon to here. Crack de Chevalier overlooks the Valley of the Christians. There are 42 villages in there and ISIS used Crack de Chevalier as its base to attack those 42 villages and tens of thousands of people had to flee. Uh -huh. Right, so I'm going to get a bed. It's Al, Al, -Khattab. Al Khattab Square in Aleppo and you can clearly tell that this was once very beautiful before the conflict and now as peace is beginning to settle here, only beginning and that the reconstruction is starting and hopefully inshallah one day it will be beautiful again. Syria's minister for tourism is Rami Martini and he's actually from Aleppo and he owns a series of hotels here that were destroyed 
by the terrorists uh, in the conflict. This is the Minister for Tourism of Syria. Do you want to say hello to my friends in yeah. Australia? Hello, Australian people. Should they visit? <laughs> should, should they come to visit? Well, uh, I think you should, you should do it. This is the Antioch Gate entering the old city of Aleppo, one of seven gates built in the 12th century. Now, you're wondering where I know this stuff? They tell me. This mosque is the Umayyad Mosque that dates from the 7th century, 1300 years old. It's interesting walking through the souk here in Aleppo because you get the mix of the totally destroyed, the partially destroyed, and the area is being reconstructed. So you can get a feeling of what it used to be like here and how much hustle and bustle it was before the war, how terrible and scary it was during the war. In this part of the old souk, you can get a sense of how frightening and terrible the fighting was from the charred smoke on the ceiling to all those bullet holes. The bullets that would have whizzed through here at the height of the fighting would have made this a truly truly terrifying place to be. Before the war, this was 15 kilometers of covered souks, one of the largest in the world, apparently 29 different souks, all of which closed their doors at sunset. The covered souks in Damascus would give a bit of an idea of what the souks would have been like in Aleppo prior to the war. This is the inside of a partially renovated caravanserai now. If you've watched one of my earlier films from Azerbaijan, for example, you know, a caravanserai is basically a hotel. Yellow Habibki, huh? And now we go to the citadel. <laughs> the citadel of Aleppo is one of the oldest in the world, which is why Aleppo claims to be uh, the oldest city in the world. Now, there's some dispute. Damascus claims that Damascus claims to be the oldest continually inhabited um, capital. Uh, Erbil in Iraq claims to be the oldest continually inhabited city. Aleppo claims to be the oldest city in the world with a couple of breaks in uh, habitation. So let's have a look at the citadel. I mean, this dates back thousands of years. This is the mosque of Zahir Gadi, who is the son of Salahuddin. So this dates back to the 13th century and is in the center of the citadel of the old town of Aleppo. Aleppo's ancient name is actually called Hada, which is a question, does he milk? Because apparently Abraham, or Ibrahim as they say in Islamic, used to come here with his goats and sheep and milk and give out free milk to the local people. So the question was, is he milking? Is he milking Hada? Which is why most Islamic people call Aleppo Hada. And this is the Sultan's Hammam inside the citadel. And I don't want to downplay conflict in any way, but I did say in the middle of the conflict in Aleppo, people would be selling oranges and buying oranges. There is a power to commerce that can have a humanitarian good. Now, it certainly was worse a couple of years ago. There's no doubt about that, and I'm not trying to downplay it. But if you really want a community to recover from conflict and cement peace, then you need to get the market economy going again. And the easiest way is to get cash into the hands of people in conflict zones as fast as you can, not into the hands of foreign aid workers and big white land cruisers. I'm having the strangest feeling walking down the street because I don't know if I'm more optimistic or pessimistic because it's, it's kind of a ghost street and you can see there was a war here and it's been cleaned up and it, feels like it's about to spring back to life so it, it's empty but clean and I'm not quite sure how that makes me feel they're building back here in Aleppo they really are question to use the old phrase can they build back better and avoid the conflicts of the past who knows but uh... so the apparent peace and normality of Aleppo belies the brutal fighting that took place here but it wasn't fighting all the way through the city. It was like in some suburbs, but not others. It's like in a Melbourne context, Fitzroy and Collingwood going at each other and being brutal and absolutely destroying the places. Whereas living in Albert Park or, or Brighton, you would have been fine. And where it was most brutal is outside of Aleppo, up towards Idlib, where Idlib itself has been totally evacuated. Not a soul is there, not a 
pane of glass in windows or a door on the hinges. And there are front lines and trenches there that don't look like they are old and gone. They look like they're waiting for reuse. You can't really get the sense as you're zooming by in a car, but these mounds, this is the front line. And one part of the conflict is we're driving through the absolute empty shell of Idlib. And one side was this front line on the side of the road. And the other is that side. And literally, just like in World War One, the two sides were 10, 15 metres apart from each other in some points for this huge kilometres long stretch from the ground between uh, Aleppo and Idlib all the way through Idlib and Idlib itself is now an empty hollowed out town where buildings have no glass, no doors, no hinges and it's just a ghost town. Now, believe me, there's a lot that I'm not touching on this video. I'm not touching about the current political situation or the current economic situation, like the fact that you've got an oil-rich country where petrol has to be smuggled from over the border for people to stop at roadside stalls rather than fuel stations to fill up the life for the average Syrian today is not good. The reasons for that are many and complicated that I'm not even going to pretend to understand. Uh, I will say this. Everywhere I've been in Syria, people have been friendly, smiling, genuinely welcoming. And like people all over the world, they're great and they're friendly people. Don't judge a people by its government, its politics or its conflicts. People everywhere want the same thing. They want a better future for their children. They might have a different definition of what that means. But if you come to most people with goodwill, they'll respond to you with goodwill as well. One of the things about Syria is it's a, a multi-religious country. We have Christian, Muslim, Muslim. And rather than arguing about politics and religion, we're sitting around having a cup of coffee together. And I've got to ask, why can't more people just do that?